Good evening, everyone. Um, so I'm, I'm also a researcher. My research is mostly uh, uh, on sleep disorders and trying to understand the brain mechanism of sleep disorders and the impact of sleep disturbances on memory, for example. But I'm not going to talk about the research at all today. Uh, what I'd like to do today with you is to be, give you a very brief overview of, um, of uh, the different sleep disorders that are relevant to aging. Um, and uh, so, um, the basically, sleep disorders can be grouped into three main categories. So you have people who are, have a difficult time to fall asleep at night, like this gentleman on the picture. Uh, so this is mostly uh, described with insomnia. And then you have people who, have, uh, who tend to sleep too long or who have difficulties to stay awake at night. So these are called hypersomnia. And one of them relevant to aging is sleep apnea. And finally, you have people who are to tend to move a lot during the night. So these disorders are called parasomnia. And among them, the, the one most relevant to aging is REM sleep behavior disorder. So let's start with insomnia. Um, so insomnia is first defined with complaints of insomnia. So a complaint of insomnia is, can be either a problem to fall asleep, problems to stay asleep, so wake, uh, waking up during the night uh, multiple times or for a long amount of times, or uh, waking up too early in the morning. So if you, look, if you just keep this criteria, you're going to say, well, I have insomnia, and <laughs> probably most of you would have insomnia. <laughs> particularly when you age, because as Julie has mentioned, as you age, your sleep becomes more fragile, so your sleep is more fragmented, so you tend to wake up a lot during the night. And so really to talk about insomnia disorder, or chronic insomnia, you need to have other things. First, it needs to be chronic, more than uh, three months, and recurrent, more than three nights a week, so that it can still be become a problem. And probably the most important point is that it must have some impacts on your daytime functioning um, uh, to be called an insomnia disorder. So it could be either problems of uh, staying attentive, concentrated, having some memory problems, having some impaired mood, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, and all these problems that would impact your professional or your private life. Um, and so this is very important because that's probably what would, uh, in most cases, differentiate um, insomnia from normal sleep with aging, as Julie has mentioned. So it must have a, a consequence on your daytime function. Otherwise, just don't stress out. That's probably because your age. Um, and so how frequent is it? So it's very frequent. So we just look at insomnia complaints. So it's probably about 50-40% of the population. Insomnia disorder is less frequent, but still it's, it's, it is the most frequent sleep disorder in the general population. We're talking about 10-15%. And when you age, unfortunately, you tend to have that problem more often. Um, some studies say that it's about 3% of the population. And if you are a woman, then you're more, more likely to have that problem as well. Um, so the impact of insomnia is... Um, I think it's uh, important. Uh, it's always difficult to say whether disorder cause, whether insomnia can cause a certain condition or the other way around because uh, insomnia is also a symptom of different disorders. So it is a bidirectional relationship in most cases. But we know that when you have insomnia, uh, studies have shown that there's, uh, people with insomnia have more frequently different psychiatric disorders, depression and anxiety in particular, cardiovascular diseases. So um, Diabetes, um, current disease, hypertension, and even stroke are more frequent in people with insomnia. And for your memory, uh, this is still a, a topic of um, intense research, but there's been now an increasing amount of uh, studies, epidemiological studies, that seem to indicate that when you have sleep complaints, uh, uh, maybe insomnia, then you have, to, you have a tendency to have a higher chance for um, uh, developing cognitive problems with aging. So this is not always, still not completely clear because in most studies, insomnia is not well defined. It's usually studies where people look at sleep durations or symptoms of insomnia. But it's, so we, we need more studies to look at that. But it seems to be the case that, yes, uh, insomnia is also important for memory. 
So, um, I mean, I could talk about it for hours about how insomnia appears. <laughs> so, I'm just going to give you a very, very basic concept. So, um, this is a very uh, popular conceptual model of insomnia. I think it's useful to, uh, for people to understand how it happens over time. So, not everyone is uh, predisposed to insomnia. So, some people have a high chance to have insomnia than others. So, these are called the predisposing factors. Um, so what are those? So you have biological traits. Uh, if you have a family history, if you're, some of your family members have insomnia, you have a high chance of insomnia. If you're a woman, if you're older, you have a high chance of insomnia. If you have some, some type of psychological traits, for example, people who tend to be more anxious or be more uh, uh, obsessive, so tend to have more insomnia. Uh, so these are all called predisposing factors. So um, so in the natural history of insomnia, these, there is often a precipitating factor. Uh, that's what you see in the middle. So, um, so and this is a life event, mostly in, most often, that could be very, very um, common, like, for example, uh, retirement or divorce or, or a medical event or uh, any type of personal event that could cause uh, increasing insomnia symptoms. And then what happens for the development of chronic insomnia is that some people who have developed this acute insomnia tend to maintain these symptoms over time because they have developed different habits or developed different um, uh, behaviors that will actually tend to perpetuate insomnia over time. And so uh, you see some examples, staying, uh, staying excessively a long time in bed or napping and etc. So, so this is basically a conceptual model of insomnia. So why is insomnia more frequent at age? I think you have, uh, so Julie has given a lot of uh, important uh, answers to these questions. I'm just basically going to repeat them. Um, so insomnia is more frequent with age because our sleep is more vulnerable with age. Uh, first, because we have more frequent health issues and these, all these health issues can increase insomnia or the sleep disorders, medical problems, etc., and so on. As we age, our sleep is more shallow, so sleep, fragment, sleep fragmentation, uh, we have less deep sleep. And as we age as well, our skin system is less efficient, our circuits for, for, to regulate our sleep as a in function of the day-night cycle is less efficient. So for all these different reasons, we are more susceptible to develop insomnia at age. But not only biologically, we are, there's also some habits that uh, can lead us to have more insomnia at age. Um, when, when, we, when we stop working, uh, so working, I mean, among the different benefits of working is that it forces us to have regular uh, habits and schedules, like waking up at a certain time, going to bed at a certain time. When we retire, you don't have these constraints anymore, and then there's often this tendency of people to uh, shift in their schedules, sleeping later, waking up later, and then, you know, sort of losing their, some of the good habits. The fact of being less active is also a problem because one of the most important drive for your sleep uh, is actually your activity. Okay? So the more active you are, the more likely you are to fall asleep. So this is what is called the homeostatic regulation of sleep. So sleep is also a recovery. Uh, and so for, for the recovery to happen, you need to increase this, this need. And, uh, and uh, if you become less active, you decrease this need for sleep. And, and this could be done for, for nap, by napping, for example. If you nap for a long time, you decrease this need for sleep, and then you increase your tendency of having sleep problems. Decrease regularity, I mentioned that. And then reduce exposure to light, and that's very important. That's uh, also one thing that Julie studies a lot. So uh, and the picture shows you uh, yeah, maybe some example of what happens in certain uh, environments where older people live, where there's not many, much light, uh, the, and so that's very important to, it's very, very important to actually to, uh, to, uh, to keep uh, being exposed to light during the day uh, in, when you age, and that's something that uh, can be a problem for many people. So what can we do with insomnia? Um, there's a lot of different treatments you can, you can see if you look over the web, uh, what I want you to uh, remember is that the first the very first line treatment, the gold standard treatment for insomnia is not pills. Okay, so even though um, if you go to your doctor, he might have the 
they used to give you a pill, well, um, it's not the first thing to do. First thing to do is to uh, change your habits and your uh, and try to rationalize the sleep problems. And so this is done through what's called cognitive behavioral therapy. And so this might sound complicated, but it's basically uh, uh, different sessions where you learn strategies to relax, but also to rationalize the sleep problems, to see am I overreacting about, uh, over my sleep problems? Is it really a sleep problem that I have? Am I exaggerating the consequences of my sleep? And am I, staying, am I losing some chances to stay active? Uh, so these are all things that are in the cognitive portion of therapy. And then the behavioral portion is very important. It's basically trying to, um, to correct the habits, the behaviors that might perpetuate in some other time. And that includes staying for long, staying in bed even though you're not able to fall asleep. It's very important to get out of the bed if you're not uh, falling asleep. And doing something else get, and going back to bed when you feel tired again. And also trying to, and what's, that's what's called sleep restriction, which might appear a bit paradoxical, but it's basically saying that you should stay in bed only the time where, where you actually sleep, and a bit, and plus 30 minutes an hour, and not more than that. So it's really to restrict your, your sleep window to the period in which you sleep. So these are different strategies that I cannot talk about in, in five minutes, but the good news is that um, now this, this treatment which traditionally happens with the therapists, the psychologists, um, are becoming more accessible with uh, platforms that you can find online that have been validated and accessible, and that will that can give you uh, some very uh, useful introduction to the therapy. Okay. Um, so what about the pills? Um, yeah, the pills can be useful in certain cases, um, particularly if you have an acute problem with insomnia. Uh, or a very severe one um, uh, to, to start the treatment or after the, the CBT if you have some persistent insomnia and certain disorders. But what you have to remember is that when, if you take a pill for sleep, it should be at the lowest dose possible. Okay, so that's very important. And when we start the treatment with uh, medication for sleep, it's actually, you have to think that you, you, that, that you have to stop it uh, as soon as possible, ideally within a month. So starting a, a hypnotic also means planning to stop it. And uh, and if you stop it, it's very and if you've been taking it for a very long time, which happens too often, it's very important to stop it very slowly over two, three months, four months sometimes. Otherwise, your insomnia will increase and then you get discouraged and you take the spill again. So it's very important to do it very slowly if you have been taking it for several years. And so the drugs that most commonly prescribed for insomnia are drugs that act on GABA. And GABA, as Dr. Jones has mentioned, uh, act, um, uh, is, is an important nutrient in the brain for the induction of sleep. So these drugs has, had, add on this uh, neurotransmitter and then you have the, uh, the different names, uh, the brands that are commonly prescribed. So the problem is, well, the advantage is that these medications act very quickly. So after a few days, it will be, after maybe the first night, you see some effects. But then the problem is that they decline the effects over time. So that's uh, what's called tolerance. And there are some adverse effects. So fatigue, sleepiness uh, during the day, and impaired cognition are important. And there's a source of dependence and rebound sound that can happen with these medications. So very important to, uh, to, to be able to, to take them only for a short amount of time. So, so, I, so I, talked, I mentioned that you know, you have people who have problems with sleep and then you have people who sleep too much. Uh, so this is called the hypersomnia. So um, the most common cause of hypersomnia is if you don't sleep enough. Okay, that's what happens particularly when you are uh, younger and then you're trying to uh, you, know, you party too much and then you <laughs> forget to see. But as we age, one of the concerning problems um, that cause hypersomnia is sleep apnea. Sleep apnea is very common too. Um, almost as common as insomnia. We're talking about five to nine, ten percent of the population. And fortunately, like insomnia, it increases with age. <laughs> uh, these times, males are more uh, susceptible than females. Good news for you ladies this time. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so as you age, we're talking more about 20, 25% of the population. So this is a very different picture, even though you have to be aware that sleep apnea and insomnia often coexist. 
uh, should be treated uh, together. Uh, so the symptoms of insomnia are excessive daytime sleepiness. So this means that you are tend to fall asleep very easily during the day, um, particularly in situations where you're less active. Uh, Sometimes people uh, will have uh, intense snoring and uh, some of your family members might witness apneas when you sleep, but it's not always easy to, to witness because people sleep in different rooms and, or people live alone, so it's not always easy to, to find. And the other symptoms are morning headaches, dry mouth, uh, and impaired cognitive function. So why is it important to, uh, to think about sleep apnea? So what is sleep apnea first? Sleep apnea is basically uh, when you stop breathing during your sleep. Uh, and the problem is that when we repeat a lot of times during the night, then your sleep is not restorative anymore. So it's not refreshing uh, because it can, some, some people, more than half of your night is, is spent not breathing. And so if you don't breathe, you don't have enough oxygen that goes to your heart, to your brain, and then you have a lot of consequences. But in, in, in addition to having an unrefreshing sleep, you also uh, expose yourself to uh, cardiovascular risk factors. And this has been quite consistently shown that there's increased risk of high, uh, hypertension, heart attack, stroke, uh, and different accidents as well because you were sleeping during the day. Uh, so this is uh, something that's confirmed in the lab by uh, recording your breathing and your sleep. Um, there's different types. Uh, you, hear, you hear people having obstructive sleep apnea, the most common type, where there's an obstruction of your upper airway. But some people have central apnea, means that your, the, your central command of breathing is affected. And you talk, you see sometimes also people referring about apnea hypopnea index, AHI. Uh, AHI refers to the number of apnea or hypopnea that you have per hour. Okay, so it's, so it's usually considered about 30 per hour severe. So, so what can people do when they have sleep apnea? When it's not too uh, severe, um, sometimes losing will be the weight and help. If you have risk factors to for sleep apnea, such as smoking, uh, it should be stopped. Uh, alcohol also should be uh, avoided in the evening. Uh, medications, uh, sedatives should also be avoided because they tend to increase sleep apnea. And then, um, interestingly, a lot of um, people have sleep apnea mostly when they sleep on the back. Okay? And so this is not the case in, in everyone, but if that's the case, then sometimes just correcting your position and doing your sleep can decrease your sleep apnea, can help avoid sleep apnea. So particularly avoiding sleeping on the back. Uh, but otherwise, most people with this sleep apnea will need to have a, a device that will uh, blow some positive pressure of air into your airway. This is called CPAP. CPAP means continuous positive airway pressure. Uh, and that's actually a very simple um, uh, mechanism where you blow pressure to maintain your airway open. And then, and then other people might need, that, but this is very specific and it's less commonly uh, done, but some people might benefit from uh, changing the position of the mandible or even surgery, but that's less often the case. And finally, in the last one or two minutes, uh, I'll talk to you about REM sleep behavior This was mentioned briefly by my previous co my, my colleagues before. So this cartoon, I think, summarizes you the situation of uh, what happens. So uh, this is REM sleep behavior disorder is a condition where the person acts out their dreams. So you see this person dreaming about a fight, and uh, and then and then he, not only does he dream of the fight but about the fight, but he acts the fight. So he would punch and kick during the night. And we know that this is due to a loss of muscle atonia. So Dr. Jones mentioned that you know the paradoxical during paradoxical sleep, you have uh, systems in your brain, particularly in your brainstem, that maintain your uh, muscle paralyzed, um, and that prevents you from moving. And these people with REM CBV disorder lose this system. The, the neurons that are responsible for this muscle atonia in the pons and the, uh, the brain stem, so the lower portion of the brain tend to become less functional. And so this happens, and so people act out their dreams. 
And so this is something. This is really something that happens with age. So if you have, if you think that you have RBD and, and, and you're 35 years old or 30 years old, you most likely don't have this because it's really something that happens older in older people. Okay. So and that's a lot of people mix uh, RBD with sleepwalking, and sleepwalking is something that's seen in children and adolescents, and it's very different because it arises from slow wave sleep, and REM sleep behavior disorder arises from REM sleep, totally different conditions. Even though I, and I agree that um, you know, the presentation itself can be a bit misleading. But so what's the, the difference is that uh, because it happens during REM sleep, it tends to happen more later during the night. So this is something the acting out of dreams uh, happens usually in the middle of the night, like 2, 3 a.m. or even early in the morning and not commonly right after sleep onset. So if you have movements right after sleep onset, it's not likely to be RBD. So these are violent behaviors sometimes, kicking, punching, um, behaviors that seem to be related to dream content. And I mean, the most important risk, immediate risk is obviously to enjoy yourself and to enjoy your pet partner. <laughs> this is why you know, sleeping in different beds can be useful. Um, and so yes, what, what should you do? Uh, so the bedroom layout is very important. It's probably the first thing you should do, <laughs> making sure to, uh, that you are safe and that you are not, uh, not at risk to enjoy yourself, enjoying a bed partner. So avoid all uh, sharp objects around the, the bed, um, like sleep in a bed that, it's, uh, either, that either has uh, some um, rails or is low enough in case you fall out of the bed. And the medications are only in cases where it becomes really uh, frequent and, and when uh, it becomes disrupting for sleep. And so we basically give some medication that act in your GABA system, like clonazepam. And uh, actually some, some people also use melatonin because melatonin has been shown to work in some studies, but the mechanism is not clear yet. Okay, so, uh, so these are two commonly prescribed medications. So why is it important to um, so identify this condition. So besides the fact that you can enjoy yourself, what is very uh, important is that uh, we now know, and there's been a, a, ton, ton, a lot of uh, studies, and particularly from uh, colleagues in Montreal, uh, Jean-François Gagnon, Ron Postuba, for example, have done a lot of work looking at how REM sleep behavior disorder is associated with other conditions. And we know that those patients actually have uh, a tendency to develop Parkinson's disease. Uh, or other forms of neurological disease a couple of years after um, RBD. So that's why it is important to uh, identify this condition because um, if, you, if you have this condition, you might need to be followed up and, and detect and, and screen for these conditions as you age. All right? So uh, that's all for my talk today. So I haven't talked about research. So if you know, want, want to know more about what we're doing in research, please go on our website. Uh, um, please also, I invite you to uh, stop uh, at, during the reception and, and discuss with my, uh, my uh, trainees. So uh, Oren and Nathan uh, will be there to show some of the studies we're doing. And like, we're always looking for participants. So if you are insomniac and want to have solutions, participate in studies. You can, you can contact us. And all the information is on the website, so we just remember SEN Lab, that's enough. Thank you. OK, that's a very good question. <laughs> so uh, there is actually, I mean, there's a lot of reasons. Uh, first, uh, dementia patients tend to have um, the, the circadian clock, um, you know, the system that regulates sleep-wake cycles, tend to be uh, damaged in when you have dementia, particularly this region called the suprachiasmatic nucleus, tend to be uh, um, uh, disrupted. So you lose your ability to recognize day and night. When you have dementia, you also have, you lose a lot of neurons in your cortex and your neurons in your cortex are important to generate your deep sleep. So you have your, your sleep will be disrupted uh, and less refreshing. And the, the other issue is that when you're demented, so you, have, you tend to be, to be less active during the day due to your condition. And so the inactivity can you know, uh, lead to sleepiness and just behaviors of uh, 
lapping and doing nothing. So there's a lot of factors, social factors, biological factors. Yeah, I mean, that's that's true. That's a very common problem with age. Uh, the, I mean, what, what should be done first is to see whether your treatment for um, for for your for prostate is uh, and for your urine function is well adapted. You might need some medications maybe to adjust that. You might also try to uh, avoid drinking too much before going to bed. Um, but, you know, there's no um, other option that I can recommend. Uh, but... If you if, it, if your disruption is mostly caused by uh, these kind of problems, usually you won't have big issues to fall back asleep. So, so um, yeah. But first, look at your prostate and urine uh, treatments. Thank you. Yeah.